Hey, this is William again, and in the last video, we looked at the design document and some other things about my Atari 2600 game, Telemachus. In this video, we're going to look at... What are we going to look at? We're going to look at moving sprites, which I learned back in the day they called stamps. So let's look at the game screen, and you're just a great little ship at this point. And I defined the sprite of the ship differently, going up, going down, going left, going right. Since you can't rotate the sprites, I redefined the shape for each change in direction. That object on the right is like a health refueling station. The blinking... <laughs> that's that's a like a space mine. Um, and it's either teleporting or there are a bunch of them and they're cloaking. I, I, I don't know, but... Once I figure that out, that will go into the backstory in the comic book. And the little blinking green light is actually the ball sprite. Because in Atari, in Atari, inside the Atari, you only have two players, two missiles, and a ball. And those are your five sprites. So I'm trying to think of different ways to do uh, color animation using the standard kernel, as it's called, where each sprite has one color and it kind of blew my mind because right away when i read that i was thinking well wait a minute pitfall harry has multiple colors so there must be a way to do it but starting out this is where i'm at right now and we'll just start at the top of the program and run down the code telemachus an atari 2600 game by me and i'm setting the rom size to 4k and i'm setting my kernel options this i don't understand yet because i was experimenting with the play field heights defining a very tall top and a very tall bottom and then one pixel two pixel two 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 one one but you know i'm just sort of <laughs> i'm just sort of haphazardly learning this learning that applying it seeing if it works how i like it if i don't etc so i'm not even currently using that right now and then i'm defining my colors here in a set uh, my initial background color my initial play field color uh, here's the background to l 160 Initial player zero, initial player one, and on the first screen, the player one sprite is actually the health ship, but it'll be the enemy on other screens. Now I'm defining some variables here. Here's my counter, C to zero, my shake screen, which I'll talk about. Defining arrays. So I defined this array, I haven't used it yet, still looking into arrays, but I thought if I can create an array that has certain color sets, then I can just call back to the array. Just learning about it. Here are the initial ship attributes, the X and Y coordinates, and the enemy, which is the health ship on the first screen. I'm plugging into W and C. Player X equals X, player Y equals Y. Player zero, here's the initial player zero sprite with the ones representing pixels that are visible. So you'll see on the left here that we have rectangular CRT TV pixels and on the right, square LCD monitor pixels, uh, because as you might expect, programming for the Atari 2600, where you're primarily using an emulator, you have a, a difference of aspect ratios for your pixels, because the emulator is on your computer monitor, and the Atari was used on a television. So that's something to be aware of. But also, inside the Stella emulator, uh, there are a wide variety of options, and you can actually correct the aspect ratio, which is cool. And you also have all sorts of effects that you can adjust, like the phosphorus appearance uh, aesthetic and scan lines and all this and that. I think there, I mean, there ought to be a way that you can like save a preference file that you can include with your game, because that would be cool. If not, I'll just write up, oh, these are the recommended old school settings in the game manual. Player one, set to W, set to Z for its X and Y. And here's where I'm controlling the health ship direction. It's flying left for a certain bit, and then it's flying down for a certain bit, and then it's flying right, and then up. Now my game loop starts, and I'm setting these different launch attributes. The color of player zero, color of player one, color of the play field. The play field and the ball share the same color. So if the health ship direction is one that go to health left, health down, health right, health up, as you can see, one, two, three, four. So let's jump down there. So here's health left. 
and this is just a temporary counter, m is m plus one. If m is greater than five, then layer one x equals itself minus one. So this, I'm just introducing a counter, and there's gotta be a, a more elegant way to do this, but I'm just introducing a counter to slow the ship down, because otherwise it flies pretty fast. As you're playing the game, maybe the ship will fly faster and faster, so it's more difficult to dock your ship with it. By the way, that's what's happening when you, uh, that's me docking. <laughs> that's your ship docking with the health ship to receive supplies and whatnot. So this counter is just slowing it down. So every five ticks of the counter, when we're moving left, it will be X minus one. And then the counter goes back to zero. This bit of code, if player one X equals 100, then health position equals two, or health direction rather equals two. So in other words, when my health station ship reaches 100, then it changes direction and it starts going down. But until then, here's how I define it going left. And I remarked this because I was trying something that I don't quite get yet. Um, and here I'm controlling the ball height, which I'm using the ball to indicate that that's a good thing because it's blinking green, see? So the ball height is one right now, one pixel, and its X and Y position is equal to the player one sprite's position plus three minus five. And I just did a trial and error because I wanted to attach the ball to the that position on the player one sprite. All right, this is William from the future. So just putting this video together, I learned something about the ball sprite. So I thought giving ball height a value of one meant one pixel by one pixel, but apparently no. Ball height zero is one pixel by one pixel. Ball height one gives you an additional height of one pixel. So it's two pixels high. And ball height two is three pixels high. So on and so on. But what it also showed me putting this video together is the occlusion process that's happening between the different sprites. If you look at the ball in light green on the left versus the ball on the right, these are both ball height equals one values. And the reason the one on the right only looks like one pixel is because the Atari draws the ball behind the player zero and player one sprites. Here's a graphic I made to explain this across all the different sprites and the background and so on. But this is more or less a visibility hierarchy. It's not a Z-depth situation because all these layers are on the same plane, but their visibility is occluded according to this hierarchy, which is officially known as object priorities. Now, I was just calling this visibility hierarchy before I learned the official name of it in the Stella Programmer's Guide by Steve Wright, written in 1979, which I should just read from top to bottom and review on Goodreads. Steve Wright was the director of software development of Atari's consumer division, and it's called the Stella Programmer's Guide because Stella was the original code name of the Atari 2600. And that's where the Stella emulator gets its name. So first we have the background, then on top of that, so to speak, the play field and the ball, and then on top of that, player one and missile one, and then at the very top, player zero and missile zero. But then I remembered combat, right? the plane, it could fly behind the clouds. So digging again into the Stella Programmer's Guide, which I should have just read at the outset, Control PF, that's a register. A register is a quickly accessible location on the processor with a fixed name and address, which contains a small amount of data providing instructions to the television interface adapter. And this register holds two bits. So the first bit in Control PF affects the ball, specifically the ball width. And the second bit affects the play field. Specifically, you can change its color and or object priority. So the first bit, if we put in a zero, then it sets the ball to one pixel wide, which is the default. So if you don't want to affect the ball, but you do want to affect the play field using the second bit, you can put zero in. Uh, if you use one, two pixels, two, the ball's four, three, it's eight. A value of 1 in the second bit means that there is no change to the play field. And this is where I goofed, looking at tutorials online and so forth, because I was reading Control pf equals 2x literally, and not realizing x was simply a placeholder. 
I thought it was the code I was supposed to enter, therefore the game wouldn't compile. A value of 3 in the second bit sets the left half of the play field to player 0's color, and the right half to player 1's color. A value of 5 sets the play field and the ball to the top, since they share object priority. And a value of 7 uses both 3 and 5, so you have the color changes and the priority changes. So this way, if I want to affect object priorities, but not the width of the ball, then I would put 0, 05 into this register. And now the play field and the ball appear over player 0, missile 0, player 1, and missile 1. And that returns us to health complete. And then we set the minefield, go to minefield screen A. And then when we come back from that, we're on minefield complete. And we're setting the play field. And I have these remarked because this was just a uh, failed experiment. Uh, I'll turn them on so you can see. So I'm just removing the remarks here. And I'm going to quit Stella, the emulator, launch it again. And this is where I learned the play field and the ball have the same color. So I'm feeding that glowing blink to the ball and that's also being fed to the play field and I don't necessarily want that. So that's when I decided um, I wasn't gonna to draw to the play field on this first screen. Yeah, so it, it, it's a conundrum at this point. Then I'm drawing the screen and then I'm going to joystick input. Here's a graphic of the pins on the back of the Atari 2600 where you plug in the joystick and which input they read from the player. Joystick up is assigned to pin one down is 2, left is 3, and right is pin 4. So I found that to check what the input is from the player, it's as simple as using the term joy for joystick, 0 for player 0, and then literally the directions, up, down, left, right. And I did a little test. I was proud of myself because I thought, how do you check diagonals if there's no you know, dedicated word for it, diagonal. And then I thought, well, what if I just use ampersands? Because I know that that's part of the language where you could do and. So I'm like, well, if up and left are pressed simultaneously, that's a diagonal, right? And then it would go to this other routine here. And it turned out that that's true. I could fly diagonal like that, but I haven't defined what the sprite looks like yet moving in that direction. So it'll check if you're pushing the joystick up or the arrow keys if you're using the keyboard on the emulator. When you're pressing up, then it'll go to the routine, show the ship flying up, down, left, right, etc. It checks for fire, but I haven't done anything with that input yet, so it just immediately goes to control complete. Below the, the loop, or is this in the loop? This is something I'm learning. What goes above the game loop, what goes after the game loop, and what goes within the game loop? I guess right now I have the ship inside the game loop. When the ship is flying up, that's what I just called this little routine here, player zero looks like this. I define player zero y equals itself minus one, and then I go to control complete. The reason I have these empty pixels, it leaves space beneath the, what I'm calling the engines, the nacelles, if you will. I was hoping I could put exhaust there, so I left it empty. But because each sprite can only be assigned one color at a time with the standard kernel, I'll have to rethink that. And if you're wondering what a kernel is, well, I, I am too. What is a kernel? Well, I finally looked it up from the Stella Programmer's Guide by Steve Wright. And it says there, the portion of the program that constructs the TV picture is referred to as the kernel, as it is the essence or kernel of the game. And an example in use for Batari Basic, the command draw screen runs the kernel to display the screen. Hey, it's me from the future again. So I did discover that you can use the kernel options within Batari Basic of the standard kernel to assign colors per row of your player sprites. At first blush, this seems like my solution to change the engine color. However, there's give and take with kernel options and this removes your ability to use the missile sprites. Is it because the missiles are used to redefine the colors? At any rate, I can't use this method since I want to use the missiles. And then we're coming back, going to control complete. Here's control complete. 
Now here's the refuel blink. This is where I'm controlling the blinking ball of the refuel health station, which is a counter that just runs and says, hey, if the counter is greater than 10, then this variable, which I'm setting as the color of the ball, is itself plus four. So it's cycling through different color settings for green and then going back to zero. So when the color of the ball reaches 208, which is a particular green, then reset it back to 196, and then it starts over again. I think as I learn more about this, I'll be able to clean it up. You can set arrays. So I'm like, well, what if I don't, what if I just create an array for colors, and then I can call the values in the array. That might be a cleaner way to do it. And below that, the collision checks, which will have their own video. And now the game loop is finally complete after the collision checks and it's going back to the start of the program and it runs all over again. And the label game loop, by the way, it's not like hard coded into the Batari basic language. You can use any label you want. Game start, happy fun time, let's play Telemachus, whatever. I'll continue to learn things and then I'll come back. We'll have uh, maybe a game at some point. Next time it's maybe the collisions video or that minefield. I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. This is uh, going to be fun. Thanks for following along. Take care.